Well, before I start, any questions first? Okay. Our first speaker is Ainsley Heilig, who is a past grand of Tuscola Lodge number 316 of Oddfellows. And the deli that uh, we are getting lunch from is actually an Oddfellows Lodge. Um, so we're going to find out today the, uh, what the Oddfellows are, uh, perhaps maybe a little bit about their connection to Freemasonry, but certainly one of the main topics he's going to talk about is uh, something that I think we're all interested in, is connecting to new members, especially a younger generation, and uh, you know, how, how they sought them out, I'm thinking, and perhaps how they found some success in attracting them and retaining them as members. So, without further ado, I'll present Pastor Grant Ainsley. Um, 
So I'm going to throw some numbers at you just as far as Illinois alone. At its peak, around the First World War, there were over 100,000 members in Illinois. And that's in over 1,000 lodges. Currently, there are around 1,700 members in Illinois, and there's 55 lodges left in Illinois. So that's definitely um, a little bit of a drop. Um, <laughs> however, um, last year we did experience a net gain in membership, and we have started the process of bringing back lodges. So that's an exciting kind of moment we hit last year. We're starting to gain a little bit of traction in Illinois. Of course, the case is different in every state, um, but and worldwide, it's, you know, depending on where you're at. Um, like, for example, Norway, in that Scandinavian countries, we are huge. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but they love Odd Fellowship in Sweden, Norway, and those places. Um, like, they'll have over 40,000 members, I think, just in Norway alone, so it's, it's huge there. But it, Odd Fellowship is a whole other beast in Europe than it is in America, which causes a little bit of, uh, butting heads sometimes. They are very, um, very, very formal, like white tie, gloves, 24-7 formal. Um, so, and we're a little bit more casual, but that's, you know, doesn't, you know, mean that the quality of the watch is different. But, um, but what I'm here today is discuss how to get younger people into your lodge, how to keep them engaged, how to keep, you know, Bridge the generational gap. Um, that is something that I think both of our orders have very much in common. So it will definitely carry over a little bit. So um, as you can notice, I am on the younger end of the scale. I'm approaching the middle. I'm 37 years old. Um, I've been a member for about five years now. And a lot of members in my lodge are I'm like probably in the middle of it. There's some that are younger, there's some that are older. Um, but there are definitely certain lodges across the nation that, that I'm finding that are tapping into something and attracting a lot of members and being very successful. And other people are struggling and they almost look with suspicion like, oh, well, what are these guys doing? They must be doing something bad because there's so many young people involved because they just don't understand how that's possible. So, um, right now is the time that we all have to reimagine what role fraternal orders can have. Um, within the vast majority of all of our lodges, you know, our lodges are mostly gone, our membership is mostly gone compared to 100 years ago. Um, and probably most of the lodges out there are just holding on to that quorum with just dear life, hoping that, like, that one person <laughs> does not die. <laughs> and preferably not the secretary. Um, <laughs> please don't ever die. Um, so the million dollar question is, how do we stay relevant and attract younger members um, while staying true to our orders? And um, so what's happening in my own lodge is uh, we came back from the dead. I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, but just this past fall, we initiated 15 new members and got more getting in line to be a candidate. And for a lodge that's been around for going on three years now, we're having a nice little boom. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so I'm not going to stand up here and say I have one single answer to magically fill all your lodges with, you know, enthusiastic, bright, shining young faces. Um, but I have figured out a few things that I, you know, work in my little corner of the fraternal world that I've also researched from other lodges that have things working. And um, if we can study these patterns of what all of these lodges are doing, and also the outliers of what some of these lodges are doing that might be a little bit out of left or right field, but are still working, you know, both patterns and outliers are very important to pay attention when you're looking at the statistics of why lodges are succeeding. So I'm going to back up a bit and give you a little bit of a backstory for me and my journey with Odd Fellowship. Uh, I discovered the Odd Fellows a little over six years ago um, when my business partner and I bought an old lodge building. 
The lodge had closed in the early 1950s, and everything had been auctioned off a long time ago, like in the early 70s, so it was just a blank room. Um, however, up in the crawl space, uh, we found about two dozen collars and a torch and some other stuff up there. And that was just like, what is this stuff? Why had it just been kind of like tossed and hidden away? Like, it was almost like, it was like the last day you're closing, let's just throw the stuff up here and, you know, hope somebody finds it someday. So that really kind of intrigued me a lot. And um, I started researching at that point. Um, so I started researching and then five years ago, um, we ended up joining a lodge that was nearby, and our experience, it really left a lot to be desired. And um, this is probably the point where most people would get off the train. And this is like the first point that needs to be made that everybody needs to, you know, with their own lodges, really be careful about. Um, what we experienced is definitely not unusual, and Probably a handful of you guys have had the same experience as well. Um, the first lodge we've gone to is what I guess we colloquially call um, kitchen table lodge. So we would just sit around the table in the kitchen of the lodge and we wouldn't even go to the big room. And the now former secretary, um, they have a very good secretary now thankfully, but the former secretary, um, the whole meeting she would just argue with everybody about everything and it was a very like kind of almost a hostile environment it you know we didn't get much work done it was mostly um, bickering um, most of the members were in their 80s and other than one couple that was in their mid 60s there was me my business partner in our mid 30s so there was definitely an age gap there um, nobody in that room really knew how anything worked and they didn't really care how things worked or how they're supposed to work as long as they got their cake and their ice cream at the end of the meeting. So that, you know, it was more of like a socializing time for them. Um, then there was us new members and I brought another couple people in too. And we were almost kind of unwelcome interlopers. And uh, we were asking too many questions we were bringing up too many ideas, and I think the lesson from this was that I was really naive, thinking that we would all fit in together and be harmonious as brothers and sisters purely because we were under, you know, the same banner of being members, and um, so that was my my big lesson. And like I said, at this point, most people would have gotten off the train. Um, the older members just wanted to hang out and eat, and they didn't want us young ends rocking the boat. And it was clear that we were not welcome, and we were left with very little choice. We could either keep going to these meetings and sit around the kitchen table, or we could just and basically just keep our mouths shut, or we could quit. Um, this common scenario drives away many young members who give up and go away they're disillusioned with what it means to be part of a great order. And instead, um, they just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, you know, I didn't see what the big buzz was all about, you know. So, um, I'm pretty tenacious, and I didn't give up that easily. Um, I guess you could say tenacious slash crazy. Um, <laughs> so, I was at a regional meeting, and I approached the past grandmaster of the state, for some advice and in about 15 minutes we had concocted an experiment because he didn't want to lose me and the other people that had joined and he heard this story over and over and over again so um, he told me I had to get 15 people together and uh, get them to commit and we would he would work on his end with the Grand Lodge and we would um, come together and get the Tuscola Lodge back. So I had the room, the lodge room, just sitting there doing nothing. It was just a storage room at that point. Um, so really, what did we have to lose? So it only took us about three months, and it took a lot of hard work. It took, 
you know, a lot of man hours of getting the lodge into physical shape. It took a lot of hours trying to get paperwork done. But um, it was it was done. We actually rechartered our lodge about three years ago this summer. And it was the first time that had been done to a chartering ceremony in Illinois in probably about 75 years. So it was a pretty big moment for the state. And uh, we had a lot of people come out that day. It was really, it was a really good day. Um, so they didn't just get us going and leave us to our own wilds either. Um, so the Grand Lodge has been a very, very active part of this whole process with getting the Tuscola Lodge going again. And I feel like that's lesson number two is make sure the Grand Lodge is very active and involved with your efforts to get things back if you are in a lodge that's dying out. Just ask for help because you know your Grand Lodge will help. Um, so they assigned us two past Grand Masters um, to come to our meetings and mentor us for the first year. So they would come down, we, we hold our, our business meeting once a month, so they come down from Fisher about 50 minutes away. Um, that year, our first year was spent really learning how to do the ritual, how to hold meetings, um, kind of build an identity of the group because you have to have a culture in your lodge and that helps build group cohesiveness <coughs> aside from, you know, just being in the group, there has to be something else there that kind of we have in common. Otherwise you end up in a situation like I had the first time where it's just like you go through your meeting and then you just sit and stare at each other because what else are you going to talk about? So um, <coughs> the second year we spent kind of trying to, you know, figure out what's our place in the community because that's another thing that we need to think about is inwardly what's the culture of your lodge and outside who are you in the community are you just you know this group that meets every so often in that upstairs room and people see the cars parked outside with the badges in the window or are you outside doing stuff in your community um, so that's when we started trying to figure out that niche because there's a lot of great groups out there already doing a lot of great things and you don't want to step on toes and you don't want to try to do something that, you know, Kiwanis is already doing better than you, or Rotary, or the Lions Club, or whichever, you know, other philanthropic type group that's in town that's, you know, maybe meets more often or has more members or more money behind it. Um, so we had to find our little niche, and it's, it's kind of a feeling out process. And, uh, but that year we started picking up a couple more members because we did start doing stuff outside our doors. Um, however, this is our third year and we're wrapping this up this third year in, the, in July. And uh, this is really when we became kind of, we got our legs, we started to come to our own. And uh, we began hosting larger fundraiser events, um, maybe once, twice a year is what we're going to focus on. And then we started doing monthly smaller events inside the lodge that were open community events. Instead of doing just a regular lodge social where you get together and eat dinner, we started doing things where we invite the community in. So um, we wanted people to come in and kind of get curious about what we're doing and kind of get excited about it. And um, our little slow trickle just really So our little slow trickle of members coming in, it just was like the hose came on and it was just like a flood at that point once we started really kicking it in the high gear. And uh, so I think in you know everything we were doing and then I got invited to speak here previously and I think I even managed to sweep up uh, four of your brothers in that momentum that we have started to build. Um, so, sure, not everybody comes every meeting, you know, we might have, you know, maybe 25% to 30, a third of the lodge show up to every meeting, and I think that's pretty normal for, you know, average numbers that you try to get, you know, to show up to your meetings. Um, but we are all very active on our Facebook group and Messenger, so
So even the people who don't come to Lodge, they basically are still included. Um, so using Facebook is very important. And every member can contribute in their own way. Um, we're just over 35 members now. And we, we can't seem to get rid of those two past Grand Masters either. Um, I think they actually enjoy driving down from Fisher to come to Lodge. So um, that kind of is really awesome that you know, they're having such a good time, they keep coming. Um, so I'm going to address two different crowds now. So the first crowd is going to be the older members. And so the advice for you is to erase your current opinions that you have about millennials. And I know that, you know, that's the last thing you want to be hearing at like 9 in the morning. But um, don't assume that you know what younger members really want to get out of a group. Um, so often I hear and I read online on uh, different uh, fraternal groups that young people don't want to join because they're too self-centered or that these old rituals don't interest millennials and they just want to stare at their phones. Um, now, if this is the vibe that Allah is putting out into the world, that, um, that'll be read pretty loud and clear that no one under the age of retirement is welcome. Um, so, you know, if that's, you know, get, get, erase that hang-up immediately. Um, younger generations have been raised in the digital era to, and they have grown up online as the world has told them that this is the new frontier and go and explore this digital realm. Um, but the novelty has become the norm for younger people and it leaves younger people empty and they're craving authentic in-person experiences. And being in a group such as ours is one way to foster that real life community that cannot be found on Snapchat or Instagram or on Facebook. The community isn't about that immediate satisfaction or the attention of you know how many likes you can get, but for that long game plan of personal growth and meaningful, worthwhile causes. Um, young people also find history to be important. It's just maybe important in a way that maybe isn't the same respect that you might approach history. Um, many Gen X and Millennials have become very involved in hobbies such as collecting antiques, um, specifically like oddities and curiosities, which kind of taps into that lodge collectible thing. Um, there's a lot of people online that are very involved in collecting specifically fraternal order stuff, and they're not even members. And you need to reach out to those people and be like, hey, I see you collect this you know, specific item. Why don't you come and join us? Um, or also another big thing is seeking out and documenting old architecture, doing urban exploration. So, you know, for example, like a hobby of mine is I like to go and photograph abandoned buildings, um, schools, old hospitals. Um, I like going up to Chinoo, um, or going lodge hunting across the state and trying to document as many old fallen old fellow lodges as I can. Um, so if you're lucky enough to get some younger folks coming, uh, make a very active effort to mentor them and try to get them up to speed. And the key word here is mentor, because um, we all have that one person in the lodge who is very quick to call out any slight error in performing ritual. And uh, I know there's probably a couple of them sitting in this room, and we get it. You know, you know more than everybody else, and we respect that. But show that knowledge with generosity and not with superiority. Um, and try to get them up to speed in a, you know, in a nurturing manner. Um, and there's definitely one word that needs to be struck from meeting vocabulary, and it's the worst thing that you can say to any member, really, um, but especially any newer member that maybe, you know, doesn't know exactly how things work or, you know, kind of get them withdrawing from your lodge culture and get them out of there faster than anything else. That word is no. And that also includes no's, best two friends, that won't work. And this is how we've always done things. Just totally strike those from your vocabulary as well because those are toxic definitely to um, getting any progress done. Um, obviously if there's an idea raised that's totally counter to how things are done, um, just fill the member in on why it cannot be done and so they can learn, but just 
flat out, no, this is how we do things, you know, that's going to make them not want to ever contribute again. Um, now, for the younger members, um, don't be afraid to pick the brains of any of the older members. They have a lot of wisdom, and they've been the ones that have been keeping our orders afloat during some of the very hard times. Um, and diversify. Learn from a variety of older members. Um, just because you've read some books online before joining, it doesn't mean you know how things really work, or, you know, and try to rebuild Rome in a day. Um, pick your battles wisely, and seek guidance from the group before bringing up something major during a meeting, so that you don't blindside everybody during new business. Um, you don't want to make the rest of them uncomfortable and go into full shutdown mode. If you do get denied, don't get mad. Um, just learn what about the ideas and working, and maybe there's a compromise that can be made, or maybe try a smaller idea first to test the waters and see if you can get everybody on board and learn, you know, learn those negotiation skills that are um, really something something that is taught in these um, groups that we don't learn in school, how to negotiate, how to get things done without discord. Um, that's a lot of times, that's a learned thing that happens very difficult. It's a very difficult process over a period of years to learn and being a member of a lodge is a great way to learn some of these very important skills that do carry over into the, uh, the, the bigger world outside of us. Um, Younger generations, they have been brought up in a world where committing to one career path um, is seen as risky. So a lot of times, you know, we see people like, oh, those kids are non-committal, they'll, you know, they just job hop and whatever. But committing to one thing is actually kind of frowned upon in younger generations. Um, they see it as risky and they spread themselves out into a variety of areas. Um, so that way they can pull up stakes and advantage ship. If uh, one of those, you know, career prospects starts to not pan out, just as it means of self-preservation, um, this doesn't mean that young people are afraid of commitment or hard work. It means that they have seen how their grandparents were able to retire after 30 years of loyalty to a company with their pensions, and they've also seen how their parents were laid off after 25 years working for that same company with nothing to show. So there is some generational learning that has kind of gotten people to where they are right now. And we just gotta realize that there are differences in how things economically do pay, play into how people behave. Um, so younger generations, um, and I, I'm, I would definitely be included in that. Uh, we were raised to go to college and get a degree and get a good career so we don't end up like our parents who got laid off. Um, only to find that by the time we graduate, we have a lifetime of crippling debt, and uh, we get a career that doesn't pay us enough to cover those uh, payments that we'll be making until we're 60 um, or older. So this has kind of created a very deep distrust of authority and skepticism for anything that promises security or success. So there is definitely a little bit of a hesitation on the part of young people to really commit to anything until they can trust it. And it's about kind of fostering that trust and building on it because if they come to the door of the lodge and they get the same kind of standoffish at first, it's, it's just purely a means of self-preservation. They, they don't want to get hurt because um, everything Everything as a young adult now is set up to disappoint you. So that's something to maybe keep in mind when you have younger people come in. Um, this kind of distrust, this has left an entire generation feeling hopeless and helpless about their future. And this is also where fraternal orders can really seize upon this moment. Um, this is, um, th these generations are in desperate need of an alternative path. And I think this is totally where we fit in. Um, it ties back into um, the younger generation needing that authentic in-person experiences that they don't have. Um, and they want to feel like they're making a difference in the world. They want to do important, meaningful work. 
And that is exactly what we are doing. And even though we no longer offer group insurance policies, like during the fraternal A day, um, the reasons why they need our orders are not that different. They need to feel empowered and they need to learn invaluable skills like the negotiating um, that they can apply to everyday life. Um, they want a group of people that they can depend on who will give them guidance and assistance in what they really need. Um, and not just from you know close friends and family, they're just gonna tell you what you wanna hear. But to have a group of people that you trust and to tell you what you need to hear, not just what you wanna hear, um, that's an invaluable thing to have as well. And that's something that also needs to be kind of played up a little bit. Um, and not, okay, so one way to kind of look at it is fraternal orders are the original social network. So, you know, probably most everybody in this room's got Facebook, you know, when you talk to people online, and it's pretty easy to develop into just evolve into fighting at this point online. It's kind of not a very fun place to be like it was, but, um, you know, make sure, you know, make sure your lodge is more than just meetings. Um, it definitely seems like, I don't know a lot about the Masonic world. I just know what I know through uh, Greg and Todd and uh, Darren. Um, but it seems like you guys are doing a pretty good job of doing more than just meetings. Um, but we need to adopt a theory and practice approach to lodges, and I think you guys are already kind of doing this a little bit. Uh, theory, meaning uh, teaching our principles and traditions, and then practice, where a lodge must offer activities that would put, in our case, of off fellows, that'll put that friendship, love, and truth into practice. Otherwise, most people won't see the essence of joining, or they won't find that connection between the ritual and the lessons of the ritual and the other activities that you're doing, they just kind of seem separate and like completely two separate entities evolving around the same lodge. Um, so to make it kind of drive home the lessons of your degrees through your activities that you do that are more social. Um, as I mentioned before, in my lodge, um, we didn't do much that first year besides the meetings. Um, we did a little bit of socializing, a little bit of charitable work. Um, we didn't really have anybody joining, um, but what was it about that this third year that happened that made everything click <coughs> and started that spike in membership? Um, so we we started doing. I think the big events really help, but I think what really is helping is doing the smaller monthly events, and they are very easy to set up, and it's really. Um, it's been amazing over the past year of doing these smaller monthly events, how you know we could get so many people in. And um, it's, I think it's something that a lot of lodges can easily adopt with no cost. Um, so for us, you know, let's, and we evolve around, usually around the culture. So we're known as the Artsy Fartsy Lodge in Illinois. And I didn't pick that name. Uh, Pastor and Master gave us that name right off the bat. So when he's, he brought that up, and he's like, you know what? Let's just run with it. And um, so even though all of our members are not artists or musicians, a lot of them are. And um, the ones that aren't, they enjoy being around artists and musicians, or they have a fascination with it. So that's our lodge culture. We'll get Artsy Fartsy Lodge. Um, however, a lot of lodges, you know, Carpentersville, they're a very successful lodge, and they're motorcycle enthusiasts. Um, Mount Zion is very active. Um, they are gun enthusiasts, and they do golf outings and things like that, and a lot of their activities are around those type of focuses. So, um, so whenever you do anything that is outside your lodge, Make sure it ties in, so it's not just a random, you know, like, oh, let's do, you know, like, uh, the first thing I could think of is, like, the meat raffle, because that's a very popular one. So, like, let's do the meat raffle, and, yeah, that's successful, but it doesn't say anything about who you are. I mean, unless you guys are really into meat, and, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, 
there's like a way that you can maybe spin it a little bit more to make it very, you know, focused on tell a little bit more of a story than just try to raise some money. Um, so we, you know, when we do these little events, um, we have one coming up uh, on Monday actually, and it's going to be for the um, Douglas County. It's a, it's a long name. Douglas County Summer Food Service Program, which is for children who are on the school free food program, and this feeds them over the summer. Uh, one of the commands of Odd Fellowship is to educate the orphans, so we do a lot of things with kids, because that falls under, we don't have orphanages anymore, so anything with children, not just orphans. So, um, and we'll do a little fundraiser that night, and any money we make that night, we will donate to that program. So every time we do a social, you know, it doesn't always have a speaker in, but um, it's a great, usually these are free community events, and you know, we're not gonna raise a ton of money doing these, but you know, hey, if we make like 50 bucks that night, then the lodge is gonna match it, and it will raise awareness to that program. Um, so the way we come up with these ideas for these little events is another way to empower your members. We have a Google Doc where um, any member of the lodge can sign up and put their idea in. And so it's a rotating concept where every month it's a different thing. We just call it Fourth Monday. And any member can bring up an idea. And I don't think we've turned down any ideas yet. I mean, of course, if there's something completely difficult to do, we'll just figure out a way to make it happen down the road. But um, this has really been a way to get younger people involved because they want to not only be a part of ritual and the more the, the static parts of being in a lodge that haven't changed over hundreds of years. They want to be a part of growing things and doing things that are different all the time. And doing a rotating event is a great way to do something different and not let it get boring. Um, so sometimes we get a big, uh, sometimes we get a pretty good crowd at these things. You know, we'll have 50 some people show up, and sometimes not so much. We may only have 20 people show up, but you know, it doesn't have to set the world on fire. They're very low pressure. They're pretty much, other than if you're bringing like some snacks, you know, it doesn't cost any money to put on, and that's the main appeal as members is that it's easy. It's so easy to do. It doesn't require, you know, other than writing something to get put in the community calendar on the newspaper or making a Facebook event, it's just super easy to do. Um, so, um, and we usually end up with at least one application every month at these events. Um, and that's, it's been a great way to farm new people that are the kind of people you want joining your lodge. The people that want to help out, the people that want to do the work, and not just join and not do anything. Um, so, another thing that we started doing that is a little, I'm sure some people would maybe think was a little controversial, but um, if somebody isn't ready to apply, um, but we do want them to be included on the, on the planning process of our activities, anything that's not official lodge business, um, we have a private Facebook group, and we uh, discuss a lot of our behind the scenes stuff uh, on this page. And um, the shy people that won't say a peep during lodge, they're more comfortable there. And um, they can you know, bring up their ideas there and share links or whatever. And uh, if people are kind of shy, it kind of helps them get to know us a little bit more before they decide if they are going to apply or not. Because you, know, you don't want to you don't want to kind of do a high pressure arm twist if you get somebody in your door and you're excited and you're like, here's your application, you know, you kind of might scare some people away, you know, get a little too, you know, like, hey, you know. But it keeps a little bit more of a low pressure cell so that way when they're ready and they decide to commit to it, they're, you know, they're fully confident and they know the group and they'll be a little bit more involved from the get go. And so definitely if your lodge even if you know, even if you're not active on Facebook, it's worth it just to have a group or a messenger thread or something, just to keep the group active and chatting during the week, and not just on lodge night. Um, 
or even like a text thread or something. Use your technology that's free. You already have it in your pocket. Just use it to keep everybody together and keep everybody going because the worst thing that happens is at the end of the night, capital drops, everybody, you know, it's like, yeah, that was great, we're gonna do this stuff. And then you go home, you <laughs> sit down, and you're like a little bit, yeah, that was cool, that was cool. Then you gotta flip on the TV and watch the TV, and then next thing you know, like all that excitement is gone. And then you kind of lose that track, and then you're like, oh, it's time to lodge again. Oh yeah, what were we talking about again? And you've lost it. You've lost that moment. And definitely, like, if you have young people in your lodge, have them spearhead this for you. Have them start the Facebook group. Have them have, make that their thing. That way, you can keep everybody active as members 24-7, seven, seven days a week, even if they don't make it to meetings. Everybody knows what's up, you know? You could, you know, what a lot of lodges are doing are making their meeting minutes into Google Docs and posting them within private group threads so that people that don't make it to meeting can read them and keep fully abreast and be included of what's going on in the lodge. Um, so finding ways to use the digital age to your advantage instead of rejecting it um, is definitely, it's, it's, at this point it's mandatory, it's not going away. And you don't have to put everything out there, but just use it in some way and it will help greatly. Um, and that leads me to my next section where there's, there is more than one way to be a good member. And this causes a lot of uh, arguing online about the right way to be a member. And um, so make sure you know that each of your members, what, so make sure you know what each of your members are looking to bring to the group um, and what they are hoping to get out of it. And I know that sounds a little, a little cheesy because you know, everybody's like, you get out of it what you put into it. But if you kind of just, just ask that question, you know, like, why are they here? What do they want from it? And that, you might learn a lot just from the simple questions of like, what do you want to get out of this experience? And what do you want to bring to this experience for everybody else? And um, those things might change over time. So if, you know, you might have to maybe do like a group powwow maybe once a year, or kind of just check in with each other. Um, some communication with the members will help them work better as a team, because you might learn some things about skills that they have that could improve the lodge that you might not even know, or they might not even think to bring up in the first place. Um, Say they, if they have the issue of not being able to make it to meetings, if they work or have kids or some other obligation during uh, lodge hours, um, try to figure out you know a way that they can be part of the group and be very active without you know that meeting being the main way they're get to do the business. Um, or maybe there's somebody who doesn't attend lodge because they're scared that they're just they don't like reading out loud, they know if they go, they're gonna get stuck in a chair that they've never read apart for that night, and they're gonna have to read out of the book, and somebody's gonna whack their finger at them for, you know, turning on the corner wrong or something. Um, and so they just avoid it altogether because they don't wanna feel like the spotlight's on them. You know, maybe you could, you know, let them know that like, hey, why don't you just come to dinner ahead of time? And if you don't wanna do the meeting, you know, try to include them and make them comfortable and try to get them back into that meeting if possible. Or, you know, just be like, okay, well, why don't you set out a few meetings, but then you could, you know, we'll give you a part that you're comfortable with instead of being like, okay, you're this tonight, okay, you're that tonight, and jumping them around. Because it's amazing how, how many people are terrified of reading out loud, even in a group of people that they are comfortable with and other and regular just social circumstances, for some reason, when you have to stand up and be the one reading, it's the scariest thing on earth for some people, and you might not know that without asking. Um, or, you know, maybe there's somebody who is good at fixing stuff, <coughs> and maybe they are that person that's not good at reading out loud, or maybe they don't ever want to be, you know, they don't want to work the chairs or get up to the Grand Lodge level, but, you know, you could have them 
do whatever repairs around the lodge. There's many different ways to contribute that doesn't make one member a better member than the other, as long as everybody's contributing in some way. And Lord knows there's a lot that needs to be done to make things work and to make things successful. So, you know, we can't all be good at the same things. Um, so back to, back to technology, you can hear me talk about technology a lot. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough about using social media or technology in general. Um, I could do a whole separate presentation on social media and using it for promotions. Um, use Facebook, just really. I know a lot of people hate it, and I, I don't post much personal stuff on there. I purely use Facebook for promoting my business and promoting my tattoos, and I use it for promoting off fellows and maybe sharing funny cat videos. But, <laughs> but that's what I use it for. You know, I don't post political stuff. I don't get in a rant with people. That is, you know, sometimes I don't get in a rant with people, but not really that often, you know. I just use it purely as a tool for promoting myself and my business and my lodge. And I would like to think that I'm a pretty successful tattoo artist in the area, and that is in, you know, obviously word of mouth is best, but social media is an extension of word of mouth. And just like with lodges, you know, it's the same thing, that word of mouth, that word of mouth on Facebook, if they see you sharing something over and over, um, you know, they'll eventually be like, oh yeah, there's a lodge there. Oh yeah, yeah, I keep seeing that over and over, okay. You know, and then maybe they'll finally come out to one of your events. It, and it's, you know, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, and it's an investment, but it's an important investment that cannot be ignored. Um, so, we even have a couple members that I don't even see them maybe once or twice a year, and but they're very, very comfortable socially online. And they do a lot of work for us on the lodge end, doing promotions and stuff, and you know, whenever we have events, you know, they have a very big, um, they can cast a very big net to get awareness out there. Um, and they're also good with, you know, organizing, brainstorming, planning, stuff that if they came to the lodge meeting, they would just sit there quietly. But you get them online, and they're just a fountain of ideas. Um, so, next thing is, uh, you're hearing a lot of, you know, you're hearing a lot of stuff that's, you know, this sounds like an awful lot of work with no guarantees, but don't wait for somebody else to do it. Um, do, you know, it's... Yeah, it's a lot of work to be online promoting your lodge and promoting your order. Um, not everything you do will be a success, and yes, it is a lot of work. Um, but at least every time you attempt it, it's uh, another attempt at you and your lodge working together and having other people see it. And it's just reinforcing those positive values that you're trying to accomplish by being in a fraternal in a fraternal order, so, you know, if you, every time, they, it's, it's just kind of, it's like Pavlov's talk, just that positive reinforcement, you know, even if somebody's not coming to your event, they keep seeing stuff over and over again, and they know you're there, they know you exist, they know there's something upstairs above that building that isn't just a mystery room, um, and don't be afraid to think outside the box, um, you know, even if there's stuff you can't do physically, like say if you're unable to go help with the, you know, the people doing the trash pickup or doing a cleanup day, you know, don't not show up for it, you know, show up and bring them drinks. There's, there's always some way to help out, but just kind of be active with your group, even if it's something you don't want to do. I mean, who really wants to pick up garbage? Nobody. But, you know, you have a good time doing it and, you know, people drive by and see you and wave and honk and so, um, but yeah, think outside the box. Um, I know you guys are a little bit more limited on event ideas and options since you guys can't do raffles or anything, correct? So that kind of, you know, obviously closes you off to a lot of things that are, you know, easy to kind of crowd pleaser events. Um, but, you know, if you're rotating, the, if you have like the same three or four functions that you're rotating every single year, and you don't shake anything up, um, that's gonna, every year, you're gonna notice that 
you know, people aren't going to come to that golf outing again and again and again, or whatever, if it's the same thing. If it's starting to trickle off, you know, maybe it's time to retire some of those tried and true functions that you've been doing for however many years and do something different because if it's not reaching the same interest that it once did, then it might be time to do something different. And even if it's something that somebody was, like that was their thing and, you know, Unfortunately, if it's not, you know, if, if it's not netting a great result, it might be time to abandon it. Um, so that's definitely where thinking outside the box really, really helps. Even if it means buddy enough with a different group in town or in the area to do something. Um, and whenever you do it, um, no matter what you do, be passionate about it. Um, if you um, if you're passionate and showing passion, positivity, and enthusiasm, that's contagious. Um, and think about like how often do you bring up your lodge to others? Um, like whenever you do talk to people about your lodge, it's like, oh hey, we're doing this thing Saturday. You should come check it out. It's going to be really cool. We got this and that and the other, and you know, we've got a bunch of great guys up here, and you know, I think you know you really dig it. Um, or whenever you talk about your lodge, you're like, ugh. Got this thing Saturday. It's really freaking early, and I'd rather just stay in bed. But I don't want to disappoint Todd. And and people are gonna see that difference, you know. So, do you, you know, whenever you do talk about your order, are you excited to tell people about it, or are you like, oh hum, you know, it's it's this thing I do, but you know, um, how many of you guys? How many of you guys have sons that are old enough to join this order? Let me just see how many. Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> how many of, okay, so there's like three of you guys. Are you, your sons, are they involved? No? Why not? Think, you don't have to tell me out loud, but just think about why, why, why are your sons not a member of this organization? Um, have they seen a lifetime of you guys just shuffling off to meetings every week or so? Just, oh, gotta go to a meeting, gotta go to lodge. Is that what you've um, shown them that it's not fun? Um, is that what your co-workers, how do your co-workers, how many of you have co-workers that are in the lodge? Some of you? How many of you have guys that are co-workers that you think would be good members to work with in the lodge. That's more hands. Why are your coworkers not members of your lodge? What have you told them to make them not want to join? So that's, you know, think about that. Like, if you are really involved in your organization and you believe in it and you're passionate about it, then try to be excited about it in front of others and make other people be interested because that's how you get people interested is by being excited about something. Um, you know, how many of you have, have uh, like rings or pins? How often do you wear them? Do you wear them every day? Good. Because, you know, every little thing, every little pin, ring or something might be like, oh, hey, that's cool. Like, you know, what's that? You know, oh, you're a mason. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, I think my granddad was a mason. You know, it gets that conversation going. That's an opportunity. Wearing a pin, wearing something, a t-shirt, a hat, whatever. That's a moment where you can positively sell yourself and your order to somebody. But be yourself about it, though. You know, tell them about what about it has made you a better man. What has improved your life by being a part of the organization. And, you know, as long as you believe it yourself and you're not coming off as like fake or brainwashed or you know because a lot of people you know they were like oh you know you guys are it's a cult illuminati uh you know but like you know be like no it's you know i, I saw a quote recently that a brother in uh vancouver had written about it's not a church it's not a secret society and it's not a social club or a service order, but it's the best of all those things. 
And that was a really kind of easy, simple way to kind of like, yeah, that really does sum it up. Sum it up. It's, it's the best parts of all these things put together and it's unique unto itself and it doesn't take away from any of those other things as well. So it's just another way to kind of think of promoting yourself in your order and selling it to younger people whenever they see something. Um, because especially right now, the imagery is so popular. Like, if you go to look at like t-shirts or anything, you'll see stuff that's got, you know, a lot of imagery that's totally lifted from our orders, that, you know, all seeing eyes and things like that. There's an interest in the esoteric and things like that right now with young people. And tapping into that would be, you know, hey, do you really want to learn more about what that really means? You know, it's not just a cool thing that's on the back of the dollar bill or whatever. You know, there's a lot more that we can teach you. Um, the um, one concept that I had seen raised maybe once online on an article is the third space. This is another way to sell it. Um, there is a sociocultural, uh, I can't talk now. There's a sociocultural concept of the third space. The third space is designated as a communal space distinct from the home. The home is the first space. Work, which is the second space. Um, the third space has been defined as a nightclub, sports arena, church, museum, or club where the individual can experience a transformative sense of self, identity, and relation to others. Being a member of a fraternal order is the perfect definition of this third space. Um, it is important in the modern age to have this third space because it creates a neutral territory that is separate from the demands of the outside world. Um, I think especially right now, this is something very important that we can use to kind of introduce people to the concept of, of being in fraternal order. We have this amazing luxury that other people don't have. We have this luxury of coming into this beautiful private space every week or month or however, and we literally shut the world out. How awesome does that sound? It's just shut the door, it's out there. And in that hour, you get to put your personal life on hold. And you get to focus on a common goal. So I think you know that's one of the beauties of being in the Hot Fellows is that, and I know with the meeting too, you know, there's no political or sectarian debate allowed, and it creates this common neutral ground where no matter what your opinions are on the news or what's happening wherever, you come as brothers or sisters to the meeting and you just leave that outside the door. And you get to work with each other and see each other as human beings and not as a label because um, everybody likes to throw nasty labels around and it kind of makes us only see people as the other and that's what's really hurting us right now as especially you know in America is the sense of somebody else is trying to hurt me and take away from me and I hate them but what if you came in that room and without even realizing it that person was that other. And you see them as a human being, and you do good work with them. And then maybe you could realize that the other is this fake thing that we've been sold to try to hate each other and not get as much work done towards positivity. And, you know, young people can benefit from this time of coming into the lodge to focus on helping others and improving themselves. And it's almost like being a young Buddhist monk, learning to meditate as they strip away their outside identity, and they leave that at the door. No politics, no religion, just, you know, working together as equals. Um, that is the very reason why our orders were into, they were just integral in reuniting our torn nation after the Civil War. I'm sure you guys have probably some good history of right after the Civil War. Um, for example, on uh, Odd Fellow End, 
the very first Sovereign Grand Lodge meeting of the Odd Fellows was in September of 1865. That was after, well, that was not the first meeting, but the first one after the Civil War. Um, after the signing of the surrender, that was the first large gathering of blue and gray at that time. And during the war, the Northern Lodges continued holding their annual meeting, the Sovereign Grand Lodge meeting, and what they did was they held the seats open for all the Southern jurisdictions who were not able to participate. And when they were finally able to return after the surrender, they marched side by side and were welcomed back as brothers, and they marched in mass in an hours long procession through Baltimore. So imagine, just months after standing literally against your brother in war, you could come back and sit next to each other and do work towards your order to be with each other and march in a parade together as equals and not as, en not as enemies. That is, that is a strong testament to the power that our fraternal orders have to breaking down barriers between people and breaking down barriers between groups and having people come together for a common goal to do good and to be together as brothers or sisters. And um, they can use their power and their fraternal bonds to set aside those differences. And so can we. And that is the power that we have right now that we need to really, really grab hold of, and that will be ultimately what brings people together and brings young people and old people together um, and uses power inside and outside our doors to create a better world. So in closing, I'll just kind of repeat the bullet points of erase your current opinions about millennials and encourage them to do the same about the older generations. Um, Lodge is more than just meetings. It's the original social network, so make sure there's something valuable that you're offering your members. Um, there's more than one way to be a good member. We all have our own comfort levels, strengths and weaknesses, and we should help members empower themselves with that knowledge and confidence. Don't wait for somebody else to take action, and don't sit on the side and be an armchair quarterback. Be passionate because no one will want to join something that you aren't genuinely excited about. And uh, Lodge is a valuable third space, separate from work and home, and gives us a neutral place to work on our personal growth. So that concludes my presentation, and if anybody's still awake, uh, I'll gladly take any questions that you may have right now. Anybody questions? One, and this, this really addresses what you said at the end, probably. It's a difficult question, which you can pretty define. In a small town context, what is the role of the federal organization lodges which are adjacent to a network of uh, community religious organizations? Um, we, in, in my particular lodge, um, we you know, have the same requirements that you do. You have to do the Supreme Bain. Um, most of our members are actually not involved with any of the churches in town or in the areas. Um, so we have not yet been able to foster any sort of uh, relationship with any of the churches in the area um, other than like donating to the food bank which is at the Methodist Church. So um, I don't even know if we would even be on their, quite on the radar per se. Um, so, but yeah, so I don't know if that's a really good answer for you. I mean. I can't speak for other lodges that are in small towns, but for us, that's, that's just how it is right now. Is we, it's, there is a little bit of a disconnect. Just be, a lot of our members are also from outside of town, so there's also a little bit of that disconnect where if they do go to church, they're gonna go to church in their own town, not in Tuscola. So we have members that come from, you know, 30 minutes away, generally, so, yeah, which is kind of the middle, so. So that there obviously is an opportunity there for reaching out, but we just haven't tapped into that yet. Yeah. You mentioned I, you mentioned <coughs> that your large lodge is the the RT lodge. 
and I do know a few of your members, and it seems to be the case, but um, is the same, do you think that that environment and that culture is part of what's drawing people to your specific lodge as opposed to Mount Zion's lodge that you said might have a gun culture or something? Are they experiencing the same amount of growth that Tuscola's is? Mount Zion is definitely one of the strongest lodges in our state. And they, back maybe 15 years ago, they were just down to their quorum. They were ready to close. And now they have close to 150 members. So their culture has done a huge service to them. And they do giant fundraisers. Um, a lot of, you know, I think the biggest fundraiser is the, the gun raffles that they do. Um, and they do a, a number of other fundraisers, like, you know, they do a 5K, they do a bunch of, they, they're always doing something, but they have the numbers that they can do it. They can do several large things a year because they can probably have several different subcommittees working on stuff. And I think their culture attracts members that work together with them. And they, they have enough members that they host a regional meeting, they do a degree day every year, and I see the same faces there, and it's usually a pretty good crowd of guys at it. So um, there's even a band made of members in that lodge that play. So their lodge culture has gotten big enough that they've even got this little subculture within the lodge. So it's really interesting to see with like somebody like them where they've, for the past decade now, been every year, they're bringing in like maybe like you know, 20 guys at least a year. And they're, they're still in this very steady growth period. Um, so that's definitely helped them. Um, us being the Artsy Fartsy Lodge and doing events that evolve around that, like the Odd Market. Uh, we did a tattoo fundraiser a couple years ago. That's helped us. Because people who are interested in those types of things are like, oh, well, I want to do more events like that. I want to take part in how would you guys put this event together? I want to take part in that. I want to help out. And so that's how we've attracted members that are the kind of people that would get along with us. Um, Carpentersville, the Century Lodge up um, in the west suburbs, they are a pretty over 100 member lodge, and uh, a lot of them are bikers. And so a lot of their things revolve around doing motorcycle related events and some little lodges are motorcycle enthusiasts up that way and a lot of their events revolve around that and that's because that's what they think is fun if you do an event that ties in with your culture it's going to be more fun for you to host so you're going to put on a little bit more that's effort and enthusiasm to make it more exciting than the same old you know like we're doing a blood drive you know like, even though that's a very worthy cause, it might not be the most exciting thing to put on, you know, for your members, unless you have a member who's very passionate about donating blood, and that's, you know, their champion. But, yeah, definitely having a culture and doing things that revolve around that culture that is, like, a culture within the bigger fraternal spectrum of the culture of being a member of the order is definitely, I feel like that is one of the secrets that isn't really secret, but if you look at all the lodges, at least for Odd Fellows, if you look at the lodges that are the most successful lodges in the country right now, they all have a very specific culture, and they're doing events that tie in with that, and that is just bringing people in, and they do a lot of stuff in their lodge that are smaller events, and, you know, like, I, like, I didn't invent the fourth Monday event, you know, like, I brought it up to do, but, I got that from another lodge, you know, because like I think like Dallas was doing it or something down in Texas, you know, it's like that's genius. So, you know, like definitely, you know, if you see a lodge doing something and you're like, why is that so successful? And if you look at it, chances are it's because it has something to tie in with the vibe that they're putting out there.